Hello. In this video, we're going to talk about something that I've referred to as the economy of programming languages. So the idea behind this video is that before we get into the details of how languages are implemented uh, or designed, uh, I want to say something about uh, how languages work in the real world and why certain languages are used and, and others are not. And if you look around, there's actually a few obvious questions that come up to anybody who uh, thinks about programming languages for more than a few minutes. Uh, one question is, why are there so many of these things? We have hundreds, um, if not thousands, of programming languages in everyday use, and, and why uh, do all of these things need to exist? Why wouldn't one programming language, for example, be enough? Uh, a related question, but slightly different, is why are there new programming languages? Uh, given that we have so many programming languages already, uh, what is the need uh, for, for new ones to be created? And finally, how do we know a good programming language when we see it? Uh, what, what makes a good programming language and what makes a bad programming language? And I just want to spend uh, this video anyway uh, talking about these three questions. And as we'll see, uh, I think the answers to these questions are largely independent of the technical aspects of language design and implementation. Uh, but, uh, but very interesting in their own right. So let's begin with the question of why there are so many programming languages. And uh, at least a partial answer to this question is not too hard uh, to come by. If you think for a few minutes, you'd realize that the application domains for programming have very distinctive and conflicting needs. Um, that is, it's very hard to design one language that would actually do everything uh, in every situation for all programmers. And let's just go through some examples. Uh, one domain uh, that you might not think about very much um, is scientific computing. So these are all the big calculations that are done for, uh, for engineering uh, applications primarily, but also uh, big science and, and, um, and, and long-running experiments, uh, simulation experiments. And what are, the, um, what are the needs for such computations? Well, typically you need very good uh, floating point uh, support, I'll abbreviate that as FP. Uh, you need um, good support for arrays and, and operations on arrays, okay, because uh, the most common data type in most scientific applications is large arrays of uh, floating point numbers. And, and you also need uh, parallelism, okay. Uh, today, to get sufficient performance, you really have to exploit parallelism in these, in these applications. And not every language uh, actually supports all of these things well. And this is actually not an exhaustive list of the things you need, but it's a few distinctive things that are needed. Uh, but one language that has traditionally done a very good job uh, of supporting these things is Fortran. And Fortran is still uh, heavily used in the, in the scientific community. It was originally designed for scientific applications, if you recall. The, the name means formula translation. And uh, it, it has uh, evolved over time. It doesn't really look much like the original language anymore, but it's always retained this core constituency in scientific computing and remains one of the leading languages in, in that domain. Now, a completely uh, different kind of, uh, of domain is, is business applications. And so what do you need here? Well, so here you're going to need things like uh, persistence. You don't want to lose your, your data. You know, businesses go to a lot of uh, trouble to get the data and they need a way to uh, hold on to it. They don't want, and they want that to be extremely reliable. Um, you're going to need um, good report facilities, okay, because typically you want to do something uh, with the data, so you need good facilities for report generation. And also, uh, you want to be able to exploit the data. The data is actually, in many modern businesses, one of the most valuable assets. And so you need good facilities for, for, for asking questions about your data. Let's call it uh, data analysis. And again, this is not an exhaustive list of things that you need, um, but it is uh, representative, I would say. And probably the most common or one of the most commonly uh, used languages for, uh, for this class of applications is SQL, uh, the database query language. So relational databases and their uh, associated programming language languages, I should say, but, but most notably SQL, um, really dominate uh, in this application domain. And then another uh, domain, let's do one more, uh, is systems programming. 
So by this I mean things like embedded systems, things that control devices, operating systems, uh, things like that. And what are the uh, characteristics here? Well, we need, we need very low level control of the resources. The whole point of systems programming is to do a good job of managing resources and so we really want fine grained control uh, over the resources. And, and often there's a, a time aspect, so you might be, have some real time constraints, so you need to be able to reason about time. Right? Because these are, these are actually, again, uh, devices and, they, and they, they need to be able to react within certain amounts of time. Um, you know, if it's a network device or something like that, you need to be responsive to the network. Uh, lots and lots of things, uh, lots and lots of examples where, where timing is important. And these are just two uh, aspects, and I'm a little bit out of, I'm running out of space here, so I'll just stop with that. But again, these are representative of the kinds of things you need in, in systems programming. And probably today, still the most widely used systems programming language or family of systems pro of programming languages is the C and, and to some extent C++ family of languages. And, uh, and as you can see, these, you know, the requirements in these different domains are just completely different from each other. What's important in one domain or most important in one domain is not the same as in another domain. And it's easy, I think, to, to imagine at least that it would be difficult to integrate all of these into one system uh, that would do a good job on all of these things. That brings us to our second question. Why are there new programming languages? Okay, well, there, there are so many languages in existence, why would we ever need to design a new one? And I'm going to begin the answer to this question with an observation that at first glance has nothing to do with the question at all. So let me just take a moment to explain it. I claim that programmer training is the dominant cost for a programming language. And I think this is really important, so I'm just going to emphasize the, the bit that's important here. Uh, it's the programmer training, the cost of educating the programmers in the language. So if you think about a programming language, there are several things that have to happen for that language uh, to get used. Somebody has to design it, but that's really not very expensive. That's just one or a very few people, typically. Uh, somebody has to build a compiler, um, but that is also not actually all that expensive. Maybe 10 to 20 people for a really large compiler project uh, can build quite a good compiler. Uh, the real cost is in all the users and educating them. So if you have thousands uh, or hundreds of thousands or millions of users of a language, uh, the time and money that it takes to teach them all the language is really the dominant cost. And here I don't mean just the uh, actual dollar expense of buying textbooks and taking classes and things like that. It's also the fact that the programmers have to decide that it's worth it for them to learn this language. And you know, many programmers learn on their own time, but that's a use of their time and the, and the expense of their time uh, is a real economic cost. And so if you think about the number of hours that it takes to teach a population of a million programmers a language, uh, that's really quite a significant economic investment. All right. Now, from this observation, we can make um, a couple of predictions pretty easily. And again, these are just, these are just predictions now uh, that follow from this uh, claim, if you believe uh, that it's true. So let me erase that and fix it. So first uh, prediction is that widely used languages will be slow to change. And why should that be true? Well, if I make a change to a language that lots of people use, I have to educate everybody in that community about the change. And so even relatively minor uh, language extensions, you know, small changes to syntax, small new features, even just simple changes in the interface of the compiler, if you have a lot of users, it takes a very long time and is quite expensive uh, to teach them all about that. So, so as these languages become, as languages become widely used, uh, the rate of change, uh, their rate of change will slow down. And, uh, and this predicts that over time, as the world of programming grows, as we have more and more programmers in the world, we would expect the most popular languages, which will have larger and larger user bases, so larger and larger programmer bases, uh, to become uh, more and more ossified, to, be, to evolve more and more slowly. And I think actually what you see in practice is, is very consistent uh, with that prediction. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, this same observation 
uh, it makes an almost what appears to be a contradictory prediction, which is that uh, easy to start, it's easy to start a new language. That in fact the cost of starting up a new language is, is very low. And why is that? Well, because you start with zero users. And so there's uh, essentially zero training cost at the beginning. And then even when you have just a few users, uh, the cost of teaching them uh, the changes in the language is not uh, very is not very high, and it's so 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 new languages can evolve much more quickly. Uh, they can adapt uh, much more quickly to changing uh, situations, and it's just not very uh, costly to experiment uh, with a new language at all. And there's a tension between these two things. Okay. Uh, when, so, so when is a programmer going to choose, you know, between a widely used existing language that perhaps doesn't change very quickly and, and in a brand new language? Well, they're going to choose it if uh, the productivity, if their productivity, you know, exceeds the training cost. So if they perceive that by spending a little bit of time and money to learn this new language, they're going to be much more productive over a relatively short period of time, then they're going to make the switch. Okay, and you know, so when is this likely to happen? Well, pro, you know, uh, putting this all together, uh, you know, languages are most likely to be adopted to fill a void. Okay, and again, this is a prediction that follows uh, from from the fact that programmer training is the main cost. What do I mean by this? Well, what I mean is that uh, programming languages uh, exist for a purpose. I mean, people use them uh, to get to get work done. And because we're still in the middle of the information revolution, there are new application domains coming along all the time. So there are new kinds of programming that emerge, uh, you know, every every few years, or even more often than that. So just you know, in terms of recent history. You know, mobile applications are now something that's relatively new, and, and there's a lot of new technology being built up to support uh, mobile computing. A few years ago, it was the internet itself was a was a new programming platform, and a bunch of new programming languages like like Java in particular uh, got started um, during that time. So, uh, new programming niches open up because the technology changes. Uh, what people want to do uh, with software changes, and this creates new opportunities uh, for languages. Uh, the old languages are slow to change, and so they have uh, some difficulty um, uh, adapting, you know, to to fit these new uh, domains, and they aren't really necessarily well suited to them for the reasons we talked about on the uh, on the previous uh, slide with the previous question because it's hard to have one language that incorporates all the features uh, you would want and so there are um, uh, so the new languages are not necessarily perfect for these application domains uh, they're slow to, uh, to adopt uh, to adapt uh, to the new situation and this tends to call forth new languages so when there's a new opportunity uh, and some application domain um, if there are enough programmers to support the language often a new language will arise just want to point out another prediction that can be made uh, from this one observation uh, that programmer training, and again I'll underline that, is the dominant cost for a programming language, and that is that new languages tend to look like old languages. That is that new languages are rarely, if ever, completely new. They have a family resemblance to uh, some, uh, some predecessor language, sometimes a, a number of predecessor languages. And, and why is that? Well, partly that it's hard to think of truly new things, but also I think that there's an economic benefit to this, namely that it reduces the training cost. Uh, by having your new language look like an old language, by leveraging off what people already know about the old language, uh, you make it easier for people to learn the new language. You make them learn it more quickly. And the, the most classic example of this is uh, Java versus C++, where Java was designed to look a lot like C++. And that was, I think, very conscious uh, to make it easy for all of the existing C++ programmers uh, to start programming in Java. 
Finally, we can ask ourselves, what is a good programming language? And here, unfortunately, the situation is much less clear. I would just make one claim uh, that there is no, and I'll emphasize no, universally accepted metric for language design. And what do I mean by that? Well, I guess the, the most important part of this uh, statement is the, is the universally accepted bit. So I mean that people don't agree on what makes a good language. There are lots of metrics out there and people have proposed lots of ways of measuring programming languages, but, but most people um, uh, don't, uh, don't believe that these are very good measures and, and there is certainly no consensus. If you just look at the world of programmers, uh, they can't agree on what the best language is and to convince yourselves of this, just go and take a look at any of the many newsgroup posts uh, where people uh, get into semi-religious arguments about why one group of languages or a particular language is better than uh, another language. Uh, but even in the research community, in the, in the scientific community, and among the people who design languages, uh, I would say that there is no uh, universally accepted uh, consensus on what makes a good language. And to just kind of illustrate the, the difficulties in trying to come up with such a metric, let me discuss one that, that I've heard people propose in, in all seriousness, and that is that a, a good language is one people use. And let me put a question mark on that, because um, I don't believe this statement. Uh, and and I think a, a moment's reflection, I, with, with a moment's reflection, I can convince you that, that this isn't a, a great measure. Um, on the positive side, I guess, the argument for this is that it's a, it's a very clear measure. Uh, it measures the popularity of the language, so how many people are actually using it, and presumably um, languages that are more widely used are more widely used for a good reason. In some sense, uh, perhaps, they are better languages. But this would imply, if you believe this and follow it to its logical conclusion, uh, that Visual Basic is the best language. Yeah, above all other programming languages. And I have nothing against Visual Basic. It's a, it's a well-designed uh, system, but I don't even think the designers of Visual Basic uh, would claim that it is, in fact, the, the world's best programming language. And as we saw in the uh, discussion that we just had, uh, there are many, many other factors besides technical excellence um, that go into whether a programming language is, is widely used or not. And in fact, technical excellence is probably not even the most important reason uh, that a language might be used. It has much more to do with uh, whether it addresses a, a, a niche or an application domain uh, for which there isn't a better tool. And then once it's established and has lots of users, of course, there's inertia and history uh, that aided in surviving, and that's why we still have uh, Fortran and COBOL and uh, lots of other uh, you know, languages from, from long, long ago uh, that we could, if we were starting over today, design much better. So to conclude this video on the economy of programming languages, I think the two most important things to remember are that application domains have conflicting needs, and therefore uh, it is, it's difficult uh, to design one system uh, that incorporates everything that you would like to have. So you can't get all the features uh, that you would like into a single system in a coherent design. At least it's, it's very hard to do that and so it takes a lot of time uh, to add new features to uh, existing systems. And the second point is that programmer training is the dominant cost for a programming language. And together, these two things, uh, these two observations, these really explain why we get new programming languages. Uh, because the old languages are difficult to change, and when we have uh, new opportunities, uh, it's often easier uh, to, and more direct to just design a new language for those rather than trying to move the entire community of, of programmers and, and existing systems uh, to accommodate those new applications.